Somebody came up here and put all of them down. I bet you was a short kid. All right. Well, I don't know about you, but this, this week's been tough. Yes. Anybody find it difficult? Um, a lot of stuff going on in our world. A lot of bad news recently. And I don't want to just hide and jump into teaching and not acknowledge a reality that there's, there are some tough things going on. Um, a lot of funerals this week. Um, some of you were involved with the, uh, the nickel funeral in Elmira. It was so full, people were overflowing the outside. Uh, you can tell they have sunburns. And then uh, the next day was a, a young woman who was found in the river. Her funeral happened. That was a sad, tragic uh, event. And then I had uh, a sad, sad funeral where uh, a twin brother killed himself um, three months ago. And uh, his, his twin living brother did the same thing this week. So mom and dad are all messed up. The brother's messed up. You know, it's just a tough week. It happens. And how do you tell people that God's good in it? Really, honestly, without sounding religious or like a total churchy fruitcake, you know? Jesus is in it. Isn't it wonderful? Trust them. That's what I feel like doing to those folks. I'm a pastor. (laughs) Well, this week, recognize someone sitting near you is in pain. Something's going on in their lives. (laughs) A quote I read from the shack at one of the funerals, if I can remember it now, at least I'll paraphrase it, that uh, uh, struggle and pain is not a requirement for grace to be there. But when there is pain and suffering, his grace is there in abundance and in many colors. So, with the stuff you guys are walking through, people going through their own stuff, we've got a barn that burned down over here and they're still trying to find the boy. You know, like, seriously? That's a lot. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? This is life, our life, our world. And yet scripture says, don't be surprised. Because what happens is we discover our source in the middle of pain. If you don't have pain and struggle going on, you have no need to look outside yourself because you become more and more self-sufficient. I can handle this. I'm in charge. This is my world. I'm in control. Listen. Papa God does not want you in control. He never did. He wants you to surrender your perceived control, (laughs) because it's a false notion anyway, and surrender that to him, so that we walk in absolute dependence on him, moment by moment, instant by instant. A term we've used in this church for that is called brokenness. We're to walk in brokenness. It doesn't mean we're kaput. In fact, the part that needs to be broken isn't the real us anyway. So we should not run away from brokenness. Surrender, another word. Well, the last last three weeks, um, or two weeks previous, uh, I started talking about how God responds to us. And the first message was fun, looking through characters in the Bible that really screwed up, and uh, how God responded to them. And he pursued them like crazy. You don't have to read all that because I'm not there yet. Um, (laughs) um, And last week, we took a a much more focused look at how God responds through the story of the prodigal son. (sighs) That was a lot of fun. I enjoyed last week a lot. Well, I thought it'd be done. So, (laughs) One more, okay? One more in how God responds. Um, If God responds by pursuing us in the face of trouble in our lives, when we're in pain, even when we think we've really messed up, God is running to us, that's an unbelievable truth. And last week when we realized that God is for us, he's already got us, we're his, that's powerful too. Well, today is the icing on the cake. Not only is he for us, running to us, but that he lavishes and gives us 
He's a generous God. God is a giver. Where does God live right now? In us. As one with you. Right? You and I are in union with Jesus Christ. And if you're one with him, you share his nature. You're not him, he's not you, but you're one. And if he's generous, guess what? So are you. We're all generous people. We just don't know it all the time. Those that do know it live out of generosity. And they are, I'm not talking about finances. I'm talking about generosity of heart, compassion, and overflowing love. Whatever that may look like. Well, this generous God has some things to share with us from the book of Ephesians. First thing. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 on. How we praise God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with some spiritual blessings in the heavenly realms because we belong to Christ. Is that what it says? No. It says, How we praise God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we belong to Christ. We heard, Ralph was talking about blessing in his prayer too. And I've often wondered, what does that word mean anyway? Like we say, bless you and, and uh, um, you know, well, bless his heart, which has many meanings. And then, <laughs> you know, may, may God bless you. Um, it can, we can be robbed of an actual meaning here if we don't look at it. The word blessing, really, it's, it's like a, a divine invoking. Uh, of we're, we're, we're hoping for the good. We're, we're wanting favor with you. May God favor you. Yeah, it's exactly right. And yet we see Paul and other writers talk about blessing and praying over people and may the Lord bless you and keep you. Like, it's not that he hasn't and needs to, because that's the implication. May the Lord bless you, implying you don't have it. No. May you realize the blessing you have is what it really means. We work from truth, we live from truth, not feelings. We don't always feel like we've got it all. We don't always feel like we're blessed with every spiritual blessing. We have been given every spiritual blessing. How many times have we prayed, Lord, I need some more of that patient stuff you got? You know, or, or can I have some of that wisdom, you know? Because Buddy's got it, I just don't. I need more of this. No, you don't. You've got it. You need to know what's in your stock house. You need to know what's inside you already. You have been given everything you need because your generous daddy loves you like crazy and has already provided you with everything you'll ever need for everything. Amen. You lack nothing at all. It gets better. Long ago, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy without fault in his eyes. Hmm, let me read that again, because that almost sounds too good to be true. <laughs> Long ago, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy. And where are you, by the way? But we just finished saying he's in us. That's weird. Wait a minute. Okay, Christ is in me. Colossians 1.27. Got it? Remember that one? Here's the secret, Christ in you. But we're also in Christ. And where's Christ? In God. In the Father. And it's all wrapped up into this wild envelope of, secure, of serious security. He's never going to leave you. In fact, the Bible says that he holds you together. Because if... If he didn't, remember those um, uh, milk commercials where if you don't drink enough milk, your body kind of goes, become like, do you remember that? Yeah. Well, if Jesus didn't hold you together, you'd be all, Bleh, you know. Even worse, it'd be like dropping jello. It'd be nasty. But he holds you together. He holds your particles together. He holds your being. 
your life. He is your life. You don't just have life. He is your very life. He's your source. So he chose us to be without fault in his eyes. Did he succeed? Did Jesus succeed so that you are faultless? Yes. Where did it happen? When did the transaction in time and space happen? It happened at the cross. So it's a done deal. He gave you a whole lot of stuff at the cross. He bought your freedom because you enslaved yourself. He didn't enslave you. Remember? It was Adam and Eve that became God's enemies. And the word enemy, if you look it up in the dictionary, it's one-sided. It's one-sided. I can be Ralph's enemy, and he can still love me. Or it can be vice versa. Adam and Eve were enemies of God. But God, they were, they were never enemies to God. Ever. Never happened. Because in their minds, they died to the belief, to the reality that God still loved them. In fact, they, they so got messed up in their minds that they clothed themselves, hid themselves, and God, knowing exactly what they did, came into the garden, knowing full well, they ate from the tree. And he came in looking for them. Adam, where are you? Over here, Lord. <laughs> where are you hiding? <laughs> I don't think it was a funny thing, but it was a real thing. He knew right then and there something happened. And where did the change happen? In God's mind or man's mind? Man's mind. They became darkened in their minds to the powerful love of God. And God needed to take out humanity, place it into Christ, and create a new creation a new species called in Christ. That's a powerful thing. Then he says, a little later, in verse 6, So we praise God for the wonderful kindness he's poured out on us because we belong to his dearly loved son. He is so rich in kindness that he purchased our freedom through the blood of his son. And our sins can be forgiven. Oh. Oh. You're right, it does say are forgiven. Yep. And our sins are forgiven. This is the good news. The good news is Jesus died for you to get rid of sin and to give you life and to free you from the darkness that our minds were in, to wake you up to the reality of his incredible love and the finished work of the cross. It's a great, great journey. So first thing he gives, he responds to us by blessing us, by giving. That's his natural response to you and I, by giving, giving, giving. We live in a culture that's really, really blessed. You know that. We live well. Wisdom is something else he gives us in verse 8. It says here, he has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. Hmm. Do we actually have, or let me rephrase that, we have the wisdom and understanding, but do we understand it? Do we experience it all the time? No. We're still growing up. When your child is born, do they, like as they get older, do parts get added? Like they're, they're born with just a torso, and then as they get more mature, then the leg grows, and then the arm, and then the ear. Like, is that how it works? No. They're born fully complete with everything they need. Right from birth, they have it all. But it takes a whole lifetime to become the person they already are. And that's what it's like for you and me. And that's what that tree is about. The seed, the sapling, and the tree. Child, young man, father. To grow up into Christ so we can mature. We can't understand all the mysteries of the scriptures. We were never meant to understand them all. We're meant to understand him and his love for us and let him take care of the rest and grow us up. None of us have arrived. None of us are even close to arriving at maturity. But there are many who are much more mature and don't wrestle and struggle with some of the stuff the younger folks do. You grow up. So he gives us wisdom. In verse 17, I want to jump right over to that for a second. 
It says, I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Here's why. So that you might grow in your knowledge of God. That's pretty cool. Paul wanted to see everyone grow in their knowledge of God. And trust me, Sunday morning is not, um, do you grow from it? Sure you can. But I don't think that's where you're really going to get your growth. I think this is just a collection of people coming together, high-fiving each other with the love of Christ. Yes, we believe and we're family. And here we learn from each other. We spur each other on with love and good deeds so that we can grow and we learn from one another. That's what a family is all about. It goes on to say, I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the wonderful future he has promised to those he called. I want you to realize what a rich and glorious inheritance he has given his people. There's more giving again. He has given you a brutal, wonderful inheritance. There's a tradition um, and some laws that uh, a parent can disown and disinherit their child out of, out of a will, Right? You can do that, especially if they tick you off pretty good. <laughs> well, an adopted child can't. In the culture, when this is written, once you're adopted, it's permanent. It can never be undone. And guess what? You have been adopted. And it will never be undone. It cannot be. God is faithful to his own promises. He cleans us up. Imagine that. In chapter 2, verse 5, I'll read 4 and 5. But God is so rich in mercy, he loved us so very much. By the way, what's mercy? Not getting what you deserve. Yeah. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. And he says he's, you're, he's so rich in mercy. Why do we perceive God then as someone who's going to get you? Oh, you've just done it too many times now. I, you know, I can't let you get away with this over and over. Is that what God's like? Not at all. That's a human, false, darkened understanding of this weird God that doesn't even exist. But it's, it's used often to control people, to keep them in fear. It says he loved us so very much that even while we were dead because of our sins... He gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's by God's special favor you've been saved. That's wild. You've been given everything you need. He cleans you up. He's forgiven you. You are a forgiven person. Jesus took all of the sin of the world onto, into himself at the cross and died once for all. That's huge. Now, what's our response to that? Believe it. We are called to repent and believe. Change our minds. Metanoia. Turn in the other direction. Repent. We're into repentance here. We just don't use that word a lot. <laughs> but we do. Changing your mind. And we change our mind about people we know as we get to know them better. We change our mind about God. We repent and get a clear picture of who God is all the time. It's repentance. It's beautiful repentance. It's the good kind. So he cleans us up. Isn't that great? And then in chapter 2, verse 10, he gives us a new identity. Some of you may not realize this, but you've been given something so powerful, so wonderful, you've been remade. Here's what he says in verse 10. For we are God's masterpiece. Not a piece of work, but a masterpiece. <laughs> There's a difference. <laughs> yeah, you might be rough. <laughs> we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew, where? In Christ Jesus, so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Why would you do good things? Because you're generous. That's how you've been created, to do good things. Children have it the best. Sometimes they think they're doing it to please mommy and daddy because they like the praise, but they, it, often it's, just, it's more 
more raw love than what us adults have come to understand. Sometimes we do things to manipulate. If I do this, they'll do that. And I'll massage my way around. I'll, I'll, I'll walk through this journey because I'm going to try and control how this person acts and functions and believes. It happens in marriages. It happens in families. It happens in churches. If you've ever been a part of a traditional church, holy smokes. <laughs> it's scary how people manipulate to control people. You've not been called to control. You've been called to be controlled by the Spirit of Christ. The Word is filled in our Bible. Be filled with the Spirit. It says, don't be drunk with wine, but instead be filled by the Spirit. The word filled means be controlled by. Because it's in you. Now let him. The phrase we've used here often is Christ is in you and he wants out. He wants to live his life out, not only through your emotions, but through your body and action, doing the good deeds he has called you to do. And he's going to plant the ideas in your head. I can't even guilt trip you into doing stuff. Well, I could, but I can't be justified in it. It's not right. Instead, I share the needs. Here we need help in different areas. We're a small church, so everybody tends to get involved, or hopefully they will, eventually. And some need to just get healed up first, and it takes a long time. But the good deeds are to one another. And when you recognize the source where it's from, from in you, because Christ is in you, and he put it there, oh, maybe, maybe this is pretty good. I, okay, I like doing this. Here's an example. I'm going to pick on Diane one more time. Sorry, Diane. <laughs> she does something that I don't like doing. Like, I'm, I like people, but to be out there greeting people every Thursday in the mall on busy market day, she just loves on everybody. How you doing? And it's like, here, want a cookie? And uh, I think last week or two weeks ago, she had how many um, uh, European students? Probably 10 off from the hall, kinds of countries. She's serving cookies to people from Germany, France, Holland, blah, 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 all these people, all these places. It's crazy. And not to mention all the other people she meets. That, like, she says, I just love doing that. And well, that's good because I don't. <laughs> Can you start to see for a second, with that illustration, how the body of Christ is to work? Everybody doing their part. Because then it's a joy to serve. It shouldn't be a burden. It's a joy. You get to, not have to. You should never have to. You get to. And that's beautiful. Lastly. Verse 2, verse 10. No, we did that already. Uh, 2, verse 8. We can go back. God saved you, Ephesians chapter 2, by his special favor when you believed. Anybody have a, a New American Standard Bible? Or King James? Nobody? Yes? Can you read for me out loud? Um, Ephesians 2, verse 8. Okay, you've been saved by faith. Now go to Galatians 2.20, same, same Bible. Can you go to Galatians 2.20 and read that for me? I should have had it up on the screen, but... Re hear the words carefully. The words matter. Because some translations just stink. They're terrible. Really? They're, they're written from a wrong perspective. Okay, Galatians 2.20. Does it say by faith in the Son of God in that one? Is that what you read? Of the Son of God. For your, okay. The correct translation there is of the Son of God. The faith of Jesus. We live by the faith of Christ. Not faith in. Okay? It can, it can sound, oh, you're saying the same thing. No, it's not the same thing. Because if I have to live by faith in the Son of God, it's up to me to maintain my faith. But your faith has been given to you as a gift. You can't even muster up faith. And yet we, we say, believe in Jesus. Have faith, kid. You can't do that. Because now you're putting more guilt on people because they can't muster it up. 
We live by, in the literal translation, it says, Son of God, faith. He's the source of your faith. And that's a gift to you. He even gives you the faith to believe in him. What's with that? What's our part? Receive. Boy, churchianity could be simplified so well. They could just nail it down to the simple, basic name, Jesus. Let's not complicate Christ's intent and how he wants us to connect. It is purely about relationship. Because relationship happens in the Trinity. Love requires an object. And in the Trinity, there are three. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And there's perfect love flowing. They love each other. Father loves the Son. Son loves the Spirit. Spirit loves the Father. And it's like perfect love called agape. Never self-seeking. Powerful, powerful image. And you and I have been placed in into the Trinity, in them, to be loved. And some have grown up trying to work for that love. <laughs> How is it working? It can be exhausting. It can give you a wrong picture of who this God is that you were actually in. You are free to love each other. You are free to love God back. You don't have to love him. But when you realize his love, you can't help because we love because what? He first loved us. He's the initiator, not you and I. He is the initiator of all faith and love. He doesn't need our help. It's pretty. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> that was funny. Okay, lastly, closing verse. Fine, we'll end early. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 3, verse 18. And may you have the power to understand, all, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep his love really is. And here's the best part. May you experience the love of Christ Though it is so great, you will never fully understand it. Then you will be filled with the fullness of life and power that comes from God. As you grow deeper in your understanding of how much God loves you, his love will flow out of you more and more. Do you ever wish and pray, God, can you use me to love people? Or be used by him for something? Like I, I prayed that all the time growing up. Well, be loved. That's it. Discover the love of Christ for you personally. Oh, well, it sounds so selfish. I'm supposed, I'm supposed to focus on everyone else. No. Children, all they focus on is themselves. They do, right? I want that last cookie. I want the sucker. They're running, especially when we have our buffets. They run out. They're the first ones there getting all the good stuff. <laughs> right? That's what kids do. Is it so bad to see yourself as a child of God? And just enjoy him instead and let him mature you and grow you up. Not use humans as your figures and models. Let Jesus be your model. Know you're loved. Know you're accepted. And live out that truth at all times. Letting Jesus do that for you. Because you can't even do that. That's good news. All right, let's pray. Ushers, will you come? Heavenly Father. Thank you for all that you've given us. Thank you for all the blessings, even if we don't use that word in our culture very much. Thank you for the wisdom you've placed in us because Christ is our life. Thank you for understanding. And you are the one who doles out how that understanding works in us. Oh, Father, if anyone here is struggling with acceptance, not realizing you actually like them, Oh, and gently, gently, gently work on renewing their minds, I pray. Thank you for those that do recognize that and that are growing up, that recognize their freedom in you, recognize their forgiveness in you. May we be loved to others authentically, without strings attached. Let's figure out how to do that.